Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be taking a look at a useful uh, routine we can use for comparing 8-bit numbers. Now this should be something that we're going to be needing to do when we're making our game programs, obviously. So we're going to take a look at a simple method today where we can compare numbers to see which one is greater, which one is less than, and which and if they're equal. So let's go right to the program here and we'll take a look. So first of all, I want to introduce you to the way I've laid out my program. And as always, I like to start from the bottom. So here I have a section at the bottom labeled values. And I'll just highlight that here, values. And so one thing I want to show you is a technique that I'm using in my assembler program. Oh, and if you don't already know, I'm using the ZX spin development environment. And there's a video how to install and use that if you uh, haven't already seen that. So here I have the ZX spin environment set up on my Windows computer, as I always use for my examples. And if we take a look at this section of my program down at the bottom, you can see I have a comment here that's labeled values. And I also have this line preceded by a label here called values. Actually, it's called underline values. And there's a reason that I'm doing that. And that is to make my development process easier because if I begin each of these section headings with a label that has an underline in the beginning, then it will show up over here in my symbols list. And the symbols are the labels that I'm using in my program. So you can see here this label, for example, called values down here. It shows up at the top of my list of symbols because I preceded it with an underline. So when I have a longer program, as we'll be seeing later in this video series, uh, when I want to be able to jump quickly to a particular section, I can easily do that just by double clicking up here on the name of the symbol, and it will bring me to that point in my program. So that's a trick you may want to use when you're using an assembler such as this as well. It works well for me, so I just thought I'd share that with you. So now let's go back to my program. So this section down here where I've labeled values, this is a section where I'm storing values into the computer memory. And this is similar to the process we would use uh, variables for in a basic program. So in this case, we're storing uh, values into memory locations and we can manipulate those values as we would variables in a basic program. So in this case, I'm going to be storing the numbers that I'm going to be comparing using this technique we're going to be looking at today. So down here, this first line using the define byte statement, which we looked at in an earlier video. This is the instruction that stores the byte of data into the computer memory. And in this case, in this first line, I have a label here called first num. So this is the first number I'm going to be comparing. And it's storing a value in this case of five. And then my second line here simply stores a value of eight using a label called second num. So that's the second number I'm going to be comparing. Now we'll move up to the previous section in my program here labeled ROM routines. And this section in my program is where I assign a value to a label that I can use to call a ROM routine. So in this line here, for example, you can see I'm assigning a value of 8859 to a label that I've called ROM1. So what this does is instead of me having to call this ROM routine by using its number 8859, I can simply call it by using its label name instead of the number. So it just makes my programming a little easier that way. And now let's go up to the top of my program here where we have our main program loop. And again, I've got it labeled main. So you can see over here on the side by having these labels that I can easily double click on and jump to the different sections in my program, it makes it very easy that way. So now, for example, if I'm down at the bottom here in my section labeled values and I want to jump to my main program loop, all I have to do is double click over here on this main label and it brings me up to my main program loop here. OK, so let's take a look at the program now and see how we can compare two 8-bit numbers. And the reason we're comparing 8-bit numbers as opposed to 16-bit numbers is because I'm using 8-bit registers to store those numbers. So let's take a look how it works. So here in the first line of my program, you can see I'm extracting the first number that I saved from the memory location and I'm loading it into the A register. So the first number is going to be in the A register and I'm going to compare another number with that number. And now in the second line of my program here, I'm getting the value of the memory location that's labeled second num and I'm storing that into the HL register pair. And the reason I'm not extracting the value of the second num number directly and putting that in a register, because there's, as far as I know, there's only one instruction that allows me to do that. And I've already used up that instruction here in my first line by extracting the value for the first number and putting it in the A register. So now what I need to do 
is manually extract the second number. And it's a bit more involved, but not really that much more complicated. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the memory address, which is labeled second num, and I'm storing that in the HL register pair. And now I can extract the value from that address right here, and I'm storing that into the C register right here. So now I have my first num stored in the A register and my second num stored in the C register. And now we're ready to compare those numbers to see which is larger or if they're equal. But before we do that, I need to execute one more instruction, which is this instruction right here, or A, which we took a look at in a previous video. And the reason I need to execute this instruction is because I want to reset the carry flag. So as you may remember, this or A instruction will not alter the contents of the A register because it performs a logical or operation, which doesn't change the contents, but it will affect the flags. And in this case, I want to reset the carry flag, which is what this instruction will do for me because I'm going to be using the carry flag later, obviously. So let's take a look at the next instruction here, which is where we actually do our comparison. So this instruction here, CPC, this is the compare instruction. And it's going to compare, in this case, the value loaded into the C register with the accumulator or the A register. That's how the compare instruction works, is it compares something with the accumulator. And in this case, since I'm giving it the register C, that means we want to compare the value that's in the C register with the value that's in the accumulator or the A register. Now, the interesting thing about the compare instruction is it's really a great little instruction because it doesn't actually affect anything except the flags. The way it works is it works the same as if we're doing an actual subtraction operation by subtracting the contents of the C register from the contents in the A register. But the result of that subtraction doesn't get saved anywhere. It just gets lost. The only purpose for using this instruction is simply to set the flags, which is what we want to do. So if you look at this instruction, compare C, what it's going to do is effectively take the value in the C register and subtract it from the value in the A register. And then it will set the flags based on the result. And then the rest of the program analyzes the result of those flags. So if we take a look at our next line here, we have a jump Z instruction. So this one is going to analyze the zero flag or the zero bit in the carry flag to see if the zero bit has been set. So if the zero bit has been set based on the result of this subtraction, that means the result is zero. So if the second number is subtracted from the first number and the result is zero, that means that both numbers must be equal. So in this case, we can see by my note here, first num equals second num. So what do we do in that case? Well, what we're going to do is if both numbers are equal, we're going to jump to this subroutine that I've labeled sub two. So now let's take a look at my subroutines. So down here, you can see I have a section called subroutines and it's over here in my list of labels as well. So I could just double click on this subs label and jump to my subroutines. And I could also jump to the individual subroutines if I wanted to, because you see I have each subroutine labeled with its own label. So here I have sub one, here I have sub two, here I have sub three, and they of course show up in my labels list over on the left here as well, or the symbols list. So I could jump to an individual subroutine if I want to. So let's say I'm up here looking at my main program loop and I want to look at this subroutine two because this line in my program jumps to subroutine two. All I have to do is go over here to my labels list and double click on sub two. And there we are at sub two. So let's take a look at what subroutine two does now that we know that both of our numbers are equal. So now that we know that the two numbers are equal and we go down to subroutine number two, let's go see what subroutine two actually does. So I wanted to indicate some way of knowing whether the numbers were equal or if one number was larger than the other one. And of course I could have gone back and used one of the printing subroutines that we learned from a previous video. But uh, just to keep my program simpler, I'm just going to use a routine to change the border color. So I'm simply going to use a routine to change the border color based on the result of the comparison of those two numbers, which is what our ROM subroutine call actually does. So if I go down here to our ROM section here, we can see where I've set a value of 8859 and assigned that to a label that I've called ROM1. And you can see by the note here, what this ROM routine does is it sets the border color per A. So when this ROM routine is called, it will extract the value from the A register and use that value to set the border color. So let's go back to our subroutine two now and see what we do when the numbers are equal. So the first line of our subroutine, it loads a value into the A register of four which is the code for the green color. 
and then it calls that ROM subroutine to set the border color. So when the two numbers are equal, it executes the subroutine number two, which should execute the ROM routine, which will set the border color to green. So if our numbers are equal, the border should change green. And the other subroutines work in a similar way depending on the outcome of that comparison. So let's take a look at our other subroutines now since we're down here in the subroutine section, since they all work in the same way. So we just took a look at subroutine two, which the label here indicates the first num equals the second num. And let's go and take a look at subroutine one since we're here. And the comment here says first num is less than second num. So if the first number is less than the second number, we're going to change the border color to red. And down here in subroutine three, if the first number is larger than the second number, we're going to change the border to blue. So let's go back to our main program loop here and see how we analyze these comparisons. So as we just took a look at using this line here, where we did a jump based on the result of the zero flag. So if the zero flag is set, that means both numbers are equal and we're going to jump to sub two, which sets the border color to green. But if the numbers are not equal, then our program continues down to the next line here, which has a jump carry instruction or JPC. So what this will do is it will analyze the carry bit and it will jump if the carry bit is set. And what's going to cause the carry bit to be set? Well, if the result of our calculation here doesn't fit into the register, then the carry bit will be set. And what's going to cause that is if we're subtracting a number that's larger than the number we're subtracting it from. So in this case, you can see we're doing a comparison using the C register, which effectively subtracts the value from the C register from the value in the A register. And if the result of that comparison is negative, then that will overflow the register. So the carry bit will be set. And that's what we're checking for right here. So in this case, when we're doing this jump carry instruction, it's going to check the carry bit, which if it's set, that means the result of our comparison was negative. And if it's negative, that means the second number, which we subtracted from the first number was larger than the first number. And you can see by my note here, first number is smaller than the second number, which means the carry bit was set. And in that case, it will jump to subroutine number one right here and set the border to red. And then finally, if the result of the comparison was not zero, that means the numbers weren't equal. And the result of the comparison didn't set the carry bit, which means the second number was not larger than the first number. Then the only other option remaining was that the first number was larger than the second number. And our program execution will continue down to the next line here, which does a simple jump to subroutine three. And if we take a look at subroutine three down here, it sets the border color to blue. So now how we would expect this program to work is it'll use this simple method of comparing the two numbers. And if the numbers are equal, it will set the border to green. If the first number is smaller than the second number, it will set the border to red. And if the first number is larger than the second number, it should set the border to blue. So let's go take a look at our numbers down here where we assign them at the very bottom of our listing and we'll see what result we should expect. So in this case, we've assigned a value of five to the first number and we've assigned a value of eight to the second number. So that means the second number is larger than the first number. And when we do the subtraction, the result should be negative and a negative result should go down here to subroutine number one and it should set the border color to red. So let's execute this program and see if that happens. So I'll go ahead and assemble here and we'll bring over our emulator. And now let's execute this program. First, let's type in a program to automatically run this program for us to save us a little work. Line 100, randomize user 30,000. Line 200, pause zero. And then line 300, we'll set the border back to white. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this program and see what happens. Ah, so our border turned red, which means that the second number was larger than the first number. So now what we want to do, as you can probably guess, is go back and modify our program to try and play with these values a bit. And now why don't we make the values equal? So I'll change this first number to eight, and now the numbers should both be equal. So I'll go ahead and reassemble. And now if you remember from our subroutine two here, we should expect the border color to change to green. So let's go ahead and run this program now, and we'll see if our border changes to green. And there we go, it changes to green. And so of course, now we want to test our third condition where the first number is larger than the second number. So I'll set this number to 10, which is larger than eight, and that should change our border color to blue. So let's go ahead and reassemble and we'll re-execute the program. 
and now we should expect a blue border, which we get. So there we have a simple method we can use for comparing two 8-bit numbers, and we can use that in our games. Now, of course, you should be typing in these programs yourself to try them out yourself and play with them and experiment with them, because that really allows you to learn more easily and more completely than just watching me do it on a video, of course. But I will copy the program listing to the video description notes down below, so you can copy and paste it into your assembler if you like, and give it a try for yourself. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.